Welcome to the first module of congestion reduction training for MPO board members. I'm your host, Wayne Garcia. This training series consists of five separate modules. By the end of this series, you'll better understand the root causes and types of congestion. You'll also recognize various policy and physical approaches to managing and reducing congestion. Most importantly, you will learn how to plan, implement, and advocate for appropriate solutions to congestion through the MPO decision-making process. But in order to get there, you need a good understanding of MPO responsibilities and authority under federal law and a firm appreciation for the role of board members as transportation decision makers, both within and outside of the MPO process. This training has been funded through the National Institute for Congestion Reduction and is being conducted by staff at the Center for Urban Transportation Research at the University of South Florida. Additionally, the Association of Metropolitan Planning Organizations, the National Association of Regional Councils, and the Florida Metropolitan Planning Organization Advisory Council each contributed staff resources as a member of the Project Advisory Committee, which provided guidance through the creation of this training series. You might be wondering why this training is starting with a discussion of transportation history. To help us answer that question, I am joined by Jeff Kramer. He is a senior research associate at the Center for Urban Transportation Research. Thanks for being with me today, Jeff. Of course. I'm happy to be here. So, Jeff, why do we need to start with history? Well, in order to best understand how an MPO board member can help address congestion in their metropolitan area, you first need an understanding how unique MPOs are in the U.S. system of government. No other government agency is established in federal law at a multi-jurisdictional level, overseen by a board comprised mostly of local elected officials, can make cooperative decisions with state, regional, and local partners on how to plan and program federal surface transportation funds. It's an odd duck. All this to improve a multimodal transportation system owned and managed by a mixture of state, regional, and local agencies. It's truly one of a kind. And one of the keys to understanding how it works is to understand why it exists in the first place. The best place to start is at the beginning of the signing of the U.S. Constitution. We're going all the way back to the 1700s. Was transportation really a government concern back then? I'll admit that it was much more of a concern for state and local governments. But from the very beginning, the U.S. government played a role in transportation. For instance, the federal government at that time provided incentives for and invested in transportation facilities with an eye towards supporting the economy of the new nation. In fact, the U.S. Constitution even granted it the power to establish a system of post offices and roads. So you're saying governmental involvement in transportation from the earliest part of our history focused a lot on, of course, the economy. Indeed. Two of the best examples of that include the focus on barge canals in the early 1800s and the transcontinental railroad in the middle of that century. What do these two things have in common? The movement of raw materials to manufacturers, the movement of finished goods between producers and consumers, and the movement of people and goods between population and commercial hubs. But the federal government never actually constructed or owned any of the transportation infrastructure built with federal money. The federal government relied on states, other governmental agencies, and sometimes even private enterprise to build and maintain transportation facilities. So that's a little mind-blowing, the fact that even back then, federal, state, local government, and leaders from private industrial sector they all had to work together to create and maintain our transportation network. How in the world did they manage that without a ton of conflict? Believe it or not, there wasn't too much conflict. Basically, through the middle of the 1900s, responsibility for transportation infrastructure was unofficially divvied up between the various layers of government, with the federal government only getting involved in the very largest of projects, primarily ones that span multiple states, and almost exclusively on the funding side of projects. The states focused on larger projects within their own boundaries, often connecting farms to markets and larger population centers to other larger population centers, sometimes passing money through to counties to build the roadways. 
counties primarily focused on local road construction, sometimes using federal funds that were handed down by the state. For the most part, city transportation issues were considered an urban problem, and cities were left on their own to address those. The Great Depression did see some small shift in policies. Those allowed federal funds to be used within the cities, but mostly to promote employment and combat congestion. And if you think urban congestion is a modern issue, you just have to look at this picture for evidence that it was not. Imagine what city roads looked like and smelled like as horses, pedestrians, and push carts started to share space with cars, trams, and buses, streetcars, and trolleys. Congestion was very much a fact of life in cities across the country. Okay, so you say this approach lasted uh, through the middle of the 1900s, uh, but I'm assuming that at some point the layer cake model began to be replaced by something else. What was the impetus for that change? It was the birth of the Interstate Highway Program. The birth of the Interstate Program, I know a lot of us kind of think and certainly uh, of just about any age, oh, that thing's been around forever. It has, but uh, yeah, this, this goes back to then. Actually, you know, the idea of a nationwide system of highways was first conceived of by the Roosevelt administration in the 1940s. This is a Depression-era idea and into the, uh, lasted into the run-up of World War II. The idea returned as the U.S. started to consider life after the war, when an enormous number of troops would be returning looking for work. There was even some fear that the country would slide into a post-war depression if the economic mobilization for the war effort couldn't be transitioned into a jobs-producing stance. The Eisenhower administration grabbed onto transportation infrastructure development as a critical component of this economic effort, and also as a way to address a new concern related to national defense, the threat of nuclear war. Because as the Cold War started to take shape and the threat of nuclear war rose, the need to move large numbers of people out of urban centers and into the countryside rose in public importance. So in 1956, in an effort to juice the economy, create jobs, and in the interest of national defense, the federal government committed to making funds available to build 41,000 miles of highway over the course of the next couple of decades what they called the National Defense Highway System. But the real game changer here was the establishment of the Highway Trust Fund, a dedicated pot of money generated from a national fuel tax, which by the way, we're still paying today, dedicated primarily to the interstate system. So the federal government got into the highway building business? No, not really. Remember, the federal government had always provided incentives and resources for others to implement transportation projects. And while some policymakers in Washington really wanted to make the interstate system a truly national program, you know, one could argue that existing patterns of fund transfers to states to build highway projects was the path of least resistance. That's what happened. So while the federal government poured huge sums of money into the interstate program, it was the states that determined exactly where how that money would be spent. That said, the interstate program subtly changed the politics of transportation by requiring a coordinated network of highways linking cities across the entire country. After all, it was not in the national interest for interstate projects across the country to not meet at the boundary between adjacent states. So for the first time, federal transportation legislation began to require coordination and some minor level of planning as a requirement for accepting federal transportation funds. But by and large, the states were entrusted to make the lion's share of funding and alignment decisions for the new interstate highway system. Okay, I get that. So the federal government is providing the money and some degree of oversight, and the states are planning and building the interstate. So what happens next? How do local governments fit in? Well, Local governments really didn't have a role to play in this process. The local communities were being impacted by the new interstate system. The states began planning the alignment for their segments of the interstate system. Many communities across the country became concerned both about the potential impact of these highways and about their lack of influence over alignment decisions. 
Some were worried that their cities were being bypassed by the interstate, reducing commerce. Good example of this is in the Southwest, where Interstate 10 bypassed a number of smaller communities across the uh, region that used to be served by Route 66. Lots of people stopping and buying goods. Now they're on I-10, they're flying by these communities. Others were concerned about the destructive impact of these massive highways, where the interstate passed through their city, cutting once vinyl communities into pieces. And some actually saw interstate projects as an inexpensive way to eliminate what they called blighted neighborhoods, and sadly, to remove or relocate poor and minority communities. And in fact, you can see evidence of this all across the country. Oh, lot, the old urban renewal. Yep, and lots of communities where currently the interstate still have uh, communities that were once thriving that were bisected by interstates, uh, and they fell on hard times, and they're having a hard time pulling themselves out. So whatever their concerns, representatives of local governments found that they lacked the necessary individual clout to impact the interstate. State road departments, and that's what they were called then, primarily state road departments, by and large, did not invite local governments to the planning table. Urban communities were underrepresented in both legislatures and in Congress. So these chambers were not very helpful. Remember, this is before uh, Baker versus Carr and, and uh, the redistribution of uh, congressional districts by population. Seeking some means of influencing the process, many local governments turned to regional advisory bodies, such as councils of government, to discuss these issues and make their collective concerns heard. Though most of these regional agencies lacked policymaking authority and were nothing more than constructive venues to share information. Still, these regional bodies became the focus of many cities and counties' efforts to impact state plans for the interstate. And in some parts of the country, under some circumstances, neighboring cities and counties found that they could exert some influence in this way. The positive experience was particularly noted by some members of Congress who were also beginning, beginning to hear complaints from their constituent local governments. This experience would have an impact on the future formation of what would become known as Metropolitan Planning Organizations, or MPOs. So what happened next then? Did anything change? Well, every few years, Congress reauthorizes the law that governs the Federal Surface Transportation Program. And the next reauthorization of that law happened in 1962 a law creatively named the 1962 Federal Highway Act. Of course. So what's so special about this act? Well, it was becoming increasingly clear to members of Congress from many states, as well as to key decision makers and transportation agencies, that something needed to be done to plan and coordinate work to meet the transportation needs of communities across the country. The 1962 Federal Highway Act gave birth to what has become the standard for regional transportation planning, a standard mandated by the federal government as a condition for the transfer of federal funds for transportation, what they call the 3C planning process. The 1962 Act required metropolitan areas with populations over 50,000 to have a transportation planning process that was continuous, comprehensive, and cooperative. Loosely translated, this means that these metro areas had to have some entity, some entity, that was engaged in transportation planning for the area that was ongoing, that would be continuous, covered the full range of surface transportation issues, so initially limited to roads and highways, that's comprehensive, and brought to the table, at least in some form, the various governmental jurisdictions impacted by and or those responsible for transportation decision-making, cooperative. And this same 3C standard remains in place today. Please note that MPOs did not exist in 1962 and were not created by the 1962 Highway Act. To meet the obligation for regional planning, many metropolitan areas adapted some existing regional advisory body or commission. Some even just put the department in the city or county structure itself. And while leadership in the planning process remained with state transportation officials, local governments now had a formal seat at the table for the first time. And for the first time, 
the federal government was requiring systematic planning activity in order to release federal highway funds. So we've spoken mostly about roads so far and that history, which was dominated by uh, roads. And of course, specifically then the interstate highway system, where does transit fit into this conversation now? Hey, that's a really good question. Actually, till the mid 1900s, transit services between cities and within cities were thriving private businesses. Transit was a for-profit venture. Private companies vied for what were often exclusive rights granted by local governments to provide transit service. Cities, for their part, paid close attention to these franchises, demanding that these companies be at least fairly responsive to various public concerns about the frequency and routes of service and the fare costs. Transit was a critical component of the urban and interurban transportation landscape, but the role of government was in most cases, that of regulator, not provider. And notice you said until the mid 20th century, what changed in the 50s and 60s? Well, the heavy marketing of the automobile and the growth of the suburbs, supported by the vast sums of public dollars being spent on the interstate system and other roadways, combined to put transit in a financial stranglehold. Very few private transit properties remained financially viable and increasing numbers each year shut down service. By the early 1960s, many cities found themselves in the unanticipated position of providing public transit service when private providers sold out or simply went bankrupt. Because of urban traffic congestion, and the needs of city residents who could not afford or want to deal with a car, cities stepped into the transit gap. But most cities were administratively and financially unprepared for these new responsibilities. After all, if the private sector couldn't make it work, what would make us think that the public sector could? But the same realities that made transit an unprofitable private venture, like I said, was a, uh, was a real problem for the public sector, and transit co was costly and a drain on public coffers. Local governments across the country struggled to find a way to cope and began turning to the federal government for assistance. Under pressure to provide some help, Congress approved the Urban Mass Transit Act of 1964. Actually, transit made its first appearance in federal law as part of the Housing Act of 1961. Remember, urban transportation problems were considered urban problems, not transportation problems. And efforts to maintain viable transit services in cities to facilitate movement of workers between home and work to combat urban congestion, which was increasing due to the effectiveness of the interstate system, by the way, definitely fell under the heading of urban problem for many lawmakers. So the first effort to provide support for urban transit systems was included in a housing act, also an urban problem, not a transportation act. The housing act made two basic contributions to public policy as it relates to transit. First, the act provided a modest amount of funding from the federal government to urban public transit, with most of the money going to capital acquisition and improvements. Second, and particularly important in the development of MPOs, the act offered policy encouragement and limited funding to support metropolitan level transportation planning, another first for federal policy. It's important to note that no federal funds were made available for transit operating expenses. In the mid-1960s, transit became enough of a priority to earn its own legislation, the 1964 Urban Mass Transportation Act. Transit was still not included in the major highway acts approved by Congress. Those focused mostly on road building and primarily the continued expansion of the interstate system. But having its own legislation did elevate transit from being viewed exclusively as an urban problem. Speaking of the interstate, did Congress's efforts to establish a more cooperative process between the states and local governments resolve the earlier problems? Well, not really. At least, not the way they wanted it to. While the 3C process did give local governments a voice, they had no real authority, no real way to alter the decisions being made by state highway departments. And I want to be fair here. It's not like the state highway departments were the bad guy in this scenario. They weren't. 
there were outspoken and visible proponents and opponents of the interstate system as it was being built at that time and the way it was being implemented. Neither side was good or bad, but there was a conflict over which things were most important, conflict between priorities. Proponents of the interstate system focused on the efficient movement of goods and people. The substantial flow of federal dollars brought the promise of job creation. Remember, they're very focused on economic activity here. It also came with an obligation to produce new construction, making project completion the bottom line. The state knew that the federal government was watching. Right? They all knew that. So they made it their priority to complete projects on time and on budget. Opponents tended to focus on the significant impacts on neighborhoods, the loss of valuable land, the subsequent impact on the tax base of local governments that relied on property tax revenues, and increasingly on the added urban traffic congestion resulting from the more efficient delivery of traffic to urban centers via the interstate system. Let me remind you, the interstate, it was working. And so people were moving out of the cities, but their jobs were still downtown. So they were driving back in, and the interstate was doing a great job of moving them. But once they left the interstate, now they were on urban roads. That created urban traffic congestion. So what we have here are different priorities, driven by different policy concerns at different constituencies. And that produced significant conflict. The conflict was being noticed by members of Congress. So is this conflict the primary driving force behind the creation of MPOs? Yes, it is. Let's step back and look at this from Congress's perspective. As we enter the 70s, member, members of Congress are hearing complaining from both sides and are aware of the conflict. And there are basically two themes that are emerging. One is the urban theme. As we've seen, federal involvement in transportation up until this point was focused on supporting and encouraging the construction or improvement of roads and highways by states. The standard states were held to were mostly about efficiency and later on, safety. Local governments, on the other hand, tended to face a variety of transportation issues that were often about handling urban congestion and fostering mobility within their boundaries, often through multimodal approaches. Also high on their list of concerns was the impact of the interstate program on their communities. In the absence of an effective forum for the reconciliation of these conflicting concerns, transportation decisions continue to create significant political conflicts. In light of these conflicts, Congress began talking seriously about developing a mechanism to ensure that the urban perspective on transportation policy would be effectively and consistently addressed in the planning of transportation projects and services using federal transportation dollars. Again, the focus on the spending of federal transportation dollars. The other theme is the regional theme. As we discussed, the need for regional transportation planning became clearly recognized, at least by the late 1950s. By the early 70s, with numerous conflicts over interstate projects in urban areas, in some conversations about the need for regionally coordinated public transit, Congress recognized the need for regional bodies with authority to address regional, multi-jurisdictional issues in the field of transportation planning and as it related to the spending of federal transportation funds. We mentioned previously that Congress has to occasionally pass a law reauthorizing the federal transportation program. In 1973, Congress approved the Federal Highway Act, reauthorizing the Federal Highway Program. It was in the Federal Highway Act of 1973 that Congress responded to the urban and regional themes we just discussed. So what did Congress do differently for the 1973 reauthorization of the Federal Highway Act? To address the need for regional coordination, transportation plans across jurisdictional boundaries, the 1973 Act mandated the creation or designation of metropolitan planning organizations, also known as MPOs, for urban areas of at least 50,000 in population. I want to be clear here, I'm not talking about the number of people in your city, the number of people in your county, 
This is based on the census de definition of an urban area. That remains true today, all the way through. So to address the urban theme, the board members of these MPOs were to be primarily local elected city and county officials. The requirement was enforced by a substantial penalty. If the MPOs were not formed, the state would lose all federal transportation funding. That's a pretty big loss. So they did it. And additionally, MPOs were obligated to approach transportation as a multimodal affair, integrating highway and transit services into a single planning process. And perhaps most importantly, the act dedicated a small but important percentage of funds from the Highway Trust Fund exclusively for MPOs to use to carry out the 3C metropolitan planning process. This helped to provide these new organizations with a degree of financial independence from states and from local governments. These are the PL funds, short for planning, uh, and these funds support the work of your MPO all the way through to today. So just to be clear, MPOs were created to address how federal transportation dollars would be spent in urban areas over 50,000 in population? Yep, that's right. The MPO was created to oversee the federal 3C process and to introduce a local voice in the spending of federal surface transportation funds. So once MPOs existed, I'm assuming they just focused on transportation issues? Well, sort of. But it's important to realize that transportation planning is impacted by a variety of other important issues, ones that the federal government has an interest in addressing. It's also important to remember that one of the biggest policy levers the federal government has is the provision of federal funds. Any agency accepting federal funds is obligated to follow all the federal rules, most of which exist to advance federal goals in related areas. And there were several other issues at that time that drove federal policy. One of those issues was civil rights. In 1964, Congress approved the Civil Rights Act. The Civil Rights Act required that any programs receiving federal assistance, including federal transportation assistance, not discriminate on the basis of race, color, or national origin. This section of the act, known as Title VI, applies to federally supported transportation activities, including activities carried out by MPOs. Title VI remains an influence on MPO activities to this day. Another issue had to do with the price and availability of oil. Two shockingly effective oil embargoes in the 1970s produced skyrocketing fuel prices, long lines at pumps, and angry citizens. As policymakers became aware of the vulnerability of the U.S. economy to the decisions of foreign oil producers, Congress began to place greater emphasis on energy conservation. The requirement to consider energy conservation remains federal transportation policy to this day, and now includes the consideration of alternative fuel vehicles and infrastructure, including electric vehicle charging infrastructure, which is really, really a buzzword going on in, in uh, Washington these days. The 1970s also saw further advances in federal efforts to reduce pollution and preserve it, the natural environment. With the enhanced federal commitment to requirement for metropolitan transportation planning, MPOs were required to consider the environmental impact of the surface transportation system on the environment, requirements that have expanded over time. Finally, the 1970s were a period of substantial economic difficulties, including periods of significant unemployment coupled with inflation, a condition that became known as stagflation. Many members of Congress and a wide range of interest groups, echoing the ideas of the 30s and the 50s, saw transportation improvements as an opportunity for job creation, an issue that continues to drive federal transportation policy as the economy recovers from the global COVID-19 pandemic. Did the creation of these MPOs solve the problems that Congress set out to address? Not really. Uh, while the existing MPO process provided a degree of input from cities and counties into the transportation planning process, the planning process in most states continued to be dominated by state transportation or highway departments. Not satisfied with that distribution of power and responsibility, the new authorization legislation passed by Congress in 1991 
made major changes for the first time in nearly two decades. That piece of legislation was called the Intermodal Surface Transportation Efficiency Act, or ICE-T. ICE-T is considered a watershed event in transportation planning. It shifted the lines of authority in a way that made the planning process more inclusive and cooperative and more fully realized the potential of MPOs by providing them with more authority, a little more teeth, if you will. ICE-T preserved the 3C planning process as it existed, but substantially enhanced the ability of MPOs to influence outcomes. We'll discuss MPO authority and responsibility in the next modules, but it was ICE-T that put MPOs in lead for planning in their metropolitan area, and it required projects to appear in MPO plans and programs to be considered eligible for federal funding. ICE-T also gave the MPOs and state transportation departments working together greater flexibility in how federal funds were to be spent. ICE-T consolidated some funding programs and expanded the types of projects that could be funded under each. These combined changes began to foster transportation planning that was perceived as being more responsive to the needs of the metropolitan areas for which they were developed. At the same time, ICE-T imposed more stringent regulation on the MPO planning process mandating in several areas that plans meet certain criteria, including more documentation and address additional issues. ICE-T also put a much greater emphasis on multimodal planning. Before ICE-T, some MPOs focused on various roadway types and considered it multimodal. Following ICE-T, the planning process broadened substantially to include all forms of surface transportation modes, including walking, biking, riding buses and other transit vehicles, so on. And the definition keeps expanding to include currently micromobility, like electronic scooters, and mobility as a service, MOS, like Uber and Lyft, and autonomous vehicles. MPOs also had to start considering where the various modes came together, something called intermodal planning. The emphasis on reaching out and including the public and important stakeholder groups in transportation decision-making also dramatically increased under ICE-T. It was a real game changer and made MPOs real players in the transportation decision-making process. That was over 30 years ago. Have there been major changes since then? Subsequent transportation reauthorization legislation, for the most part, has preserved the role of MPOs in the transportation planning process. Sure. Congress has tweaked the program by streamlining the process in some areas, reducing regulation where feasible, and adding and removing funding programs, and so on. These things go back and forth, but the MPO remains the lead planning agency in the metropolitan planning process. That has only become a cemented part of federal law. The biggest change came in 2012 with the passage of the Moving Ahead for Progress in the 21st Century Act, or MAP-21, which introduced performance-based planning and programming, a subject we will address in future modules. Please also note that since ICE-T, all federal reauthorizations have had much snappier titles and acronyms, some better than others. If you were to summarize this brief history, what would you say are its central themes? So I see three important themes in this history, but I think it wouldn't be hard to identify others. First, in my view, is the acknowledged tension between local and state perspective, which has been one of the driving forces behind the creation and empowerment of MPOs. It's not good or bad, but various parties will have different views on what's important. That's why Congress created a cooperative transportation planning process for metropolitan areas, so that all sides have a chance to participate in the decisions being made using federal surface transportation funds. Second, is a recognition of the need for regional coordination across local jurisdictional boundaries, which has been at the heart of the idea of MPOs as regional entities and has justified the creation of MPOs as distinct policy bodies. As our urban areas grow and increasingly grow into each other, the need for coordination both within MPO and between MPO boundaries becomes even more apparent. The third theme I see is an ongoing commitment to planning, plans that are thoughtful and mindful 
of a vision of the future, informed by significant public engagement, reviewed by a wide range of stakeholders, and that will be regularly updated to consider changes in technology, economic conditions, revenue availability, and more. After this discussion, I think our viewers will have a much better understanding of why MPOs exist and the role they are intended to play in transportation decision making and in the spending of federal service transportation funds. I hope so. That was a lot to take in. Here are a few questions they can consider about their own MPO process to help them consider more deeply what we discussed in this module. And these questions really are just the tip of the iceberg, but you can look at so what were major transportation issues when your MPO was created? If you don't know that, ask your staff. That's an important question to ask. What are the issues today? And has your organization's processes and plans evolved to reflect those changes? And how does your MPO engage with its partners? And are you considering and planning for a variety of transportation modes and strategies for implementation? So viewers, please make sure you reinforce what you're learning by talking with your MPO staff. And don't hesitate to reach out to AMPO or NARC with questions or feedback. Thanks for watching this module. In the next module, we'll discuss the roles and responsibilities of MPOs. That will prepare you for a more detailed discussion on congestion reduction and the role that MPOs can play in congestion reduction. Thank you for watching.